Rob Wolcott, welcome to Partnering Leadership. I'm thrilled to have you in this conversation with me. Thanks, Mahan. It's great to be here. Can't wait to talk about proximity, how coming breakthroughs in just in time transform business, society, and daily life. Before we get to that, Rob, would love to know whereabouts you grew up and how your upbringing impacted who you've become. Oh, wow. How many hours do you have for that? <laughs> uh, That's I'll the whole to... podcast, Rob. I'll, I'll try and be brief. So I'm a product of the Midwest of the United States. I, I was born in Indiana and we moved to the Chicago area when I was one and a half, basically. I moved around a little bit, but 1976, we ended up in the Chicago area and I spent my entire life in those environs. I travel a lot, but I lived only in the Chicago area until two and a half years ago. When, when in the midst of COVID, I said to my lovely wife, Ada, you know what? Every time I drive downtown Chicago, I pass my freshman dormitory. I'd like to move. So she said, all right, where do you want to move? And we did a, a sweep of the country all online because it was COVID. We looked at Bozeman, Boulder, Denver, Austin, New York area. And for a bunch of reasons, the New York area won. So we live in Northern New Jersey now, Ridgewood, New Jersey. I am so shocked, Mahan, by how much I love Ridgewood, New Jersey, other than the taxes. It's great. <laughs> what do you love so much about it, Rob? The weather is about 25% easier than Chicago, which I suppose is not a very high bar. We love seasons, but the seasons aren't too harsh. The people are great. We have a lot of great friends here. It really is the Garden State. Once you get out of Newark, once you get out of that opening montage of The Sopranos, <laughs> it's the Garden State. It's a beautiful place. And actually, just to summarize, Mahan, part of the reason I love this place is I told my very good friend, Bob Hendrickson, who was born in Brooklyn many years ago and then did well, moved to Manhattan, moved to New Jersey. Now he lives in Florida. And he said, Rob, what do you think of New Jersey? And I said, I, I love it. I think I figured out the people. He said, oh, what do you mean? I said, they're aggressively friendly. And he said, oh, it's just like New York, except without the friendly pot. So there you go. The people here in Ridgewood are aggressively friendly, and I love that. That's outstanding, Rob. Now, you've been in the space of business leadership innovation for quite a while. What got you to think about this concept of proximity? I actually remember, Mahan, about when it started. I was at a conference, and I honestly don't remember the exact conference. It was 2014. And at that conference, I'm sure you and many of your listeners have been in the technology or related spaces for a long time. And you might recall years ago, there was about a 15-year period where everybody who would speak, heaven forbid, I never did this because it drove me nuts, but <laughs> everybody who would speak at a technology conference would have two obligatory slides. One was Moore's Law, how everything doubles every 18 months. And I thought, if you think you have to present that to this audience, you're in the wrong room. Really, we've all seen that, okay? The second one, which was even more inane, was by the year 2030, a trillion devices will be connected. Really? Whoa, boy, oh boy. So I was sitting there depressed, actually. <laughs> and I thought, all these digital technologies are coming and people are paying a lot of attention to them, which is great. But there must be some common underlying characteristics or dynamics of digital that if we can discern them, what is fundamentally different from the industrial age, then we can develop foresight as to where the world is going. And that was the question I started with, which was what is fundamentally different about digital overall? So this could be AI, mobile apps, of course, IoT, but it could also be rooftop solar power or 3D printing. They're all digitally enabled. And what, after a little bit of work, we, we realized was that digital allows us to compress capabilities in smaller and smaller packages, all kinds of capabilities, and distribute them all over the economy ever closer to each moment in time and space. And that's what led us to the sort of aha moment, which we call proximity, which is because of that distributed coordinative nature of digital, digital pushes the production and provision of value ever closer to the moment of actual demand in time and space. And we can unpack that during our conversation, if you like, Mahan, but that's where it started. 2014, at a conference, I was tired of seeing the same slides over and over again. And I thought, what's underneath that can tell us where the world is going? 
I love that perspective, Rob. Now, there's a lot of unpacking to do with a couple of sentences you shared there. You said compress capabilities. Help me yeah. understand that better. If you think about digital technologies, they allow us to have access to capabilities in smaller packages. So uh, let's think conceptually. If I have a mobile phone and I have access to a network, I can access most or all of the capabilities on the network. So if I have cloud, then I don't need massive computing capabilities resident with me in order to access a large language model. I just need access to the network. But it's not just fully digital capabilities like mobile apps or large language models. It's also physical things like 3D printing, additive manufacturing, allows us to have smaller footprint equipment that can make an expanding variety of things and work with an expanding range of materials to create. And look, it's not ready for prime time in many ways, but in some ways it is. In some ways it's already more economical. It's already saving people money, making companies faster, more responsive. And guess what's going to happen, Mahan? they're going to get better and better over time. So you can draw this line fairly broadly. You can think of rooftop solar or distributed energy resources, or DERS, as they say in the energy industry. These distributed energy resources contrast a solar array with a battery backup with a massive centralized power generation plant. That's, that's sort of the industrial age solution. And these distributed wind, solar, perhaps one day small-scale nuclear I was in Bhutan last year and I saw a, a distributed hydroelectric, very small footprint, hydroelectric power generation. These are all examples of proximate power generation. So digital allows us to compress capabilities and distribute them all over the place and coordinate between them. That compression, distribution, coordination, I imagine it impacts organizational operations leadership thinking drastically. Yeah. In what ways do you see organizations will need to adjust to be able to take advantage of that? That's a deep question. It has a lot of implications. Uh, on the highest level, I'd say it has to do with the pace, the volatility, not just the rate of change, but also the volatility of change. A lot of people focus on the fact that change is happening fast. That's true. But that could also elicit a notion that it's happening in the same direction, which it's not. It's quite volatile these days. So things will pop up tomorrow that you didn't expect. And then, by the way, six months later, everybody will assume that's just the way, you know, of course we can do that. And that's <laughs> happening over and over again. So what does this mean? The old planning cycles of let's do an annual strategy review or heaven forbid, let's create that three-year strategy document. I'm, by the way, a big fan of looking out three years, five years, 10 years, creating a strategy with the longer term in mind. I'm a big fan of that, but it's not really a quote unquote plan where you're then gonna lock it down, lock and load and start to execute. That's not gonna work anymore. You've gotta continually refresh and iterate. Imagine if let's say for instance, you're an insurance company and it's early 2022, which wasn't that long ago. And you do a comprehensive review of new technologies and you say, here's what we need to invest in and here's what we need to do with our core businesses to stay relevant. And you start implementing. And then all of a sudden in late November, 2022, what launches? Chat GPT. And, and if, if you just say, oh, you know what? We'll get around to that the next time we do our annual strategy review. It's already too late. You've got to be doing it on a regular basis. The, the second thing I'd say, Mahan, and we can talk more about this, I do a lot with this in my classes at the Kellogg School and the Booth School at Northwestern University of Chicago, and that is we have to become better at asking the right questions. We have to become better at defining exploratory challenges rather than as leaders posing direction or posing directives to our team, saying, here's the answer team, go out and execute. Sometimes that's the right thing to do, but sometimes it's wrong to have the answer. Uh, so that's really where I'm focusing a lot of my time. How do we frame better challenges and pose better questions? Outstanding perspectives, Rob. I want to understand your approach to these a little bit better. I've been for quite a while, a big advocate for questioning as a part yeah. of being able to lead in this environment. Love Warren Berger's work on 
uh, questioning. I just heard an interview with the CEO of Perplexity AI. Yeah, great. And wow. One of the things that per Perplexity does is the first step of the LLM is to reformat the question it's been given to be a better question. Because part of what they have determined is that most of us are not good at asking questions. Yep. So what are the types of questions and what is the type of thinking that leaders can approach their organizations with as we are going through these changes that you talk about? Great. So one tool that I love, and I've seen leaders use it to great effect, and this could be CEOs, it could be senior salespeople. Great salespeople can be really good at this. And that is when someone poses a question to you, asking in obviously a nice and non-confrontational way, what's behind that question? What's your why for asking that question? And what you often find is you understand how to answer better. And sometimes the person posing the question starts to understand their own question better. Or you can help together recognize, and that's one of the reasons I, I love your approach, Mahan, about partnering leadership. You can become better together by recognizing what we're really trying to accomplish, the reasons why we're asking questions. And then we can become much better at asking the questions. That's really important. And I appreciate you highlighting it. Now, you also mentioned that there are four major catalysts in your view that are propelling businesses and society toward this concept of proximity that you talk about. What are those four catalysts? Thanks for that. And, and note what we're saying in the book is that these catalysts are accelerating the trends toward proximity as opposed to determining them. What enables proximity are digital and digitally enabled technology systems, business models, et cetera. The, the digital technologies enable us to do more anywhere, anytime, for anything. But the things we mention in the book, these catalysts are things like COVID. So the pandemic was, and we all felt it. You probably felt catalyzed when we were in the middle of it where we were thrust into our home offices in a matter of a week or so, we're all of a sudden we're at home trying to figure out how to use a webcam for real work. And while it wasn't great for some things, most of us were surprised by how good it actually was, how, how much more capable it made us. So COVID was a catalyst to enable people to be anywhere to do anything. So as we say, for instance, in the chapter, how we work, you don't have to be physically proximate to add proximate value. And just to digress on this one point briefly, Mahan, early in the process during COVID, I was having a conversation with a colleague, a research colleague about proximity. And he said, wow, this is great, Rob. It feels like what we're doing right now is actually anti-proximity. I said, what do you mean? At the time I was at home in Evanston, Illinois, where Northwestern University is. He said, you're in Evanston and I'm in Europe. And so we're not proximate at all. And I said, ah, aha, it's actually the opposite. There's nothing more proximate than a Zoom call. Why is that? Because it doesn't matter where you are physically. The value is being created on the screen between the two of us. So you see, Mahan, that's why we state the definition of proximity as digital pushes the production and provision of value. We don't say product services experience because the customer ultimately doesn't care about your products. The customer cares about the value. So Zoom is an example of proximity, allowing us to live and be anywhere, but yet still connect and, and, and do business. I agree with you that this enables proximity in so many different ways, shapes, and forms. Yeah. That therefore then has implications for our cities as we are seeing it, the future recruitment and retention and sourcing of talent compensation. That one point that you made impacts so much of what we are used to with respect to how we live and how we work. A absolutely. In fact, Mahan, on that point, one of the experts that I worked with, so my co-authors, Kaihan Krippendorf, and Kaihan and I decided to organize the book around different sort of realms of life. 
you could think industries, but it's really more how we live and experience the world. So we have how we work, how we eat, how we create and produce, how we prevent and cure, how we power and how we defend. And in the last chapter, we talk about space and virtual reality, because those are the two horizons of the 21st century. But in any case, in each of these how we chapters, it wasn't just Kaihan and me making stuff up and doing a little online research. <laughs> we did that, but then we also asked two serious industry experts for each chapter to read, review the chapter, make sure we weren't saying anything totally stupid, to make sure we understood how the power industry worked or the agriculture space works. And for the How We Work chapter, John Bremen was one of those people. So John is the chief innovation acceleration officer for Willis Towers Watson, now called WTW. It's the, one of the largest HR consultancies and insurance brokerages in the world. John's been deep in the world of work his whole career. And one of the things that he shared with me as he talks to boards and early on in the COVID crisis, one of the board members said, board members said, well, and gee, John, one of the things is it's really hard to manage a team when you're remote, when you're online most of the time. And he said, yeah, first of all, it's always been hard managing teams. I mean, that's a skill you learn over decades. Some are good at it, some aren't, but you learn it over decades. Number two, in this emerging world, you know what? If you decide you can't manage teams remotely, then maybe you can't manage. And the answer is not to say, everybody, let's go back to the office all the time. Certainly, there's a good case for being in the office together on some sort of regular basis. That's a different discussion. But we are all going to be foisted into situations where the maximum value, the optimized value situation is that we can work together remotely in time and space to make things happen. And that's going to be managing in an online space. So you're absolutely right. And there are answers out there, but they're evolving real time because we all are. I, I think about just that one accelerator and the implications it has, but that's one of the accelerators built on this proximity. A second one would be supply chain. So there are two here. One is climate and severe weather. The data are clear, severe weather incidents are going up quite a bit. Also, geopolitics. So geopolitical threats causing everything from conflicts between Russia and Ukraine to the conflict in the Red Sea, for instance, that's all very tangible and not only a human tragedy in, in many cases, but directly impacts bottom lines and risk and for companies of all sorts. So one of the critical solutions to some of these geopolitical challenges people have been talking about for a while, they call reshoring. So the idea is we're quite dependent on so much production in China and other places. Maybe we need to bring some of that back home. Now, that's a much longer discussion. It's an important discussion. But just to make one critical point that is surfaced by proximity, as we're thinking about reshoring, as we're thinking about bringing production of more and more products, assemblies, parts, uh, sub-assemblies, et cetera, closer to demand. The wrong way to do it is to think, oh my gosh, we need to copy that great big plant in China or Mexico or Germany or whatever and, and build one here next to our. That's a fool's errand in most cases. Instead, we have to leverage the best of what we've got, the, the latest automation, the latest robotics. And those allow us to start to do the math differently. Those allow us to hypothesize mid-sized production facilities, multiple production facilities in a network closer to demand in each case. Eventually, they'll allow us to have production of various products in urban areas, right downtown, near and responsive to customers. And eventually, you'll have one on you know, your counter at home in your kitchen. There'll be some version of 3D printing. I don't mean this Christmas, although who knows? But three years, five years, 10 years, we'll start to have some production equipment at home where for certain kinds of products, I don't have to wait two hours for Amazon to deliver it to me. And by the way, by that time, we'll think two hours for delivery is a tragedy because <laughs> we'll be able to download some push button and it'll print out. Or our AI system will just decide that Mahan needs this thing before he knows. It'll print out, will show up at home and you're going to say, oh, I didn't know I needed that, but boy, I needed that. So what we have to do as we reshore and think about resiliency and adaptability with all of the geopolitical challenges, climate crises, et cetera, going on, 
is we have to think about what we could never have done before. What can we do with technology to be more and more efficient in a more proximate, hybridized, distributed production strategy, whether that's the corporation that's doing that or an industry looking across an ecosystem or national policymakers or regional policymakers, whatever it is, we have to take the best of what's coming and plan for that as opposed to building yesterday's solutions. I think one of the mistakes that some companies seem to make uh, post-COVID was to learn the lessons about the supply chain challenges that they had, that maybe they need to go back to the way things were. But what you're saying is that, yes, they do need to adjust, but there is a moving forward yeah. that is very different. Absolutely. In fact, I would think about it very differently. When COVID hit, you remember we all started talking about resiliency. I know what people meant, and I agree, but when I started to do some research about the word, because I wanted to understand what it actually meant, and one of the people I called whom, whom I knew would have a scientifically grounded perspective is David Krakauer, and we quote David in the book a few times. He's the CEO of the Santa Fe Institute in Santa Fe, New Mexico, which is the epicenter of complexity research. It's one of the global centers of complexity research founded by four or five Nobel Prize winners back in the 80s. And David is an, an evolutionary geneticist. So I called him and I said, David, what does resiliency mean in the context of complexity theory as a scientific matter? And he said, Rob, resiliency specifically means the amount of time that a system requires to return to the way it was before when assailed by an external force, an external shock of some sort. And that struck me because I think what we don't want, if we're smart, is we don't want to figure out how to return to the way we were, were before. What we want instead is to how to become more adaptable, more evolvable. And uh, Dr. Krakauer said, that's exactly right. The word in com complexity theory, the words are adaptability and evolvability. And that's really what people are looking for. They're not really technically looking for resiliency. They're looking for adaptability and evolvability. And this is what digital technologies give us in a big way. When we're planning more proximate business models or technology platforms, because digital technologies are more pliable, they're more flexible, they can learn real time than compared to an industrial age factory where we build the plant, lock it into the ground, and boy, it's hard to move a 2000 ton cold process forming press, but it's not hard to move a mobile phone app. So we have to think in terms of adaptability as we invent these solutions for the future, because we can do things now we could never have done before. So in doing that, Rob, one of the challenges that I see in organizations is that it is the leadership and then the people of the organization that need to be adaptable to be able to follow through the strategies that you're talking about. Would love to get your thoughts on what are approaches for executives and leaders to have the kind of mindset where their people are willing to be adaptable? Great question. I'd say the first thing I'd recommend to executives and leaders is make sure you're trying it. Even if you've got legions of people who are much smarter about these things than you are, and by the way, if you do, that's the right answer. As a leader, you want to make sure you have lots of people who are smarter than you are about all these things. Find some time, make some time to try some of this stuff yourself. It's hard to really understand it and then even harder to fit it into your rubric, to fit it into your plans, if you don't even, as a basic matter, understand how it works or what it's doing. And so and this could be as easy as, in the case of generative AI, this would be as easy as, as going on chat GPT and throwing some queries in, throwing some prompts in and seeing what comes out. If you're a little scared of it, then start with the free version. <laughs> but then as you graduate, pay the 20 bucks a month, call Microsoft and get the upgrade, the co-pilot, but try the stuff. That's the first thing. Second, after you've tried a little bit, make sure some of your people know you're trying it. And don't act like you're an expert, unless you really are, unless you truly are. Don't act like you're an expert, they'll see right through it. But show that you're in the mix, that you're trying. And then third, I'd say, ask questions. One of my 
great friends and someone I've learned so many things from over the years is a fellow named Toby Redshaw. And Toby has been a, a technology leader forever. I met him when he reported to the CIO of Motorola many years ago. He supported some of my early research. And then he was CIO of Aviva in the UK. He was CIO of Amex for a little bit. He was in charge of 5G strategy for Verizon. So he's had a wide purview. And one of the things he's done for most of his career, which I love, is he's had reverse mentors. So he's a CIO or an SVP, pretty significant. And he would say to HR, I want a couple of our brand new people who right out of college, I want to meet a couple of them. And, and every few months, I want a new reverse mentor. And all I'm asking them to do is let's go to lunch once a month. You don't have to talk about our business. I just want to know what's most interesting and cool and exciting for you in the world of technology, media, et cetera. I want to know what you're seeing and experiencing. And that doesn't take a lot of time. By the way, it's also a great staff development and outreach. And look, these young new managers who are coming into your company, boy, are they going to talk about that. Oh my gosh, I had lunch with uh, Toby. He's the SVP of XYZ and oh, it's so cool. They're going to tell all their friends. It has a little bit of rippling effect in the organization too. So you're learning, they're learning, you're growing real time. So I'd say things like that. Ask questions, get in the mix, try the stuff, make sure your people know you're trying it and don't act like an expert unless you really are. In most instances, executives, as you said, appropriately so are not the experts and don't need to be the experts. And don't need to be. Yeah. You and I follow this stuff all the time, Mahan, but I would never tell people that I'm a leading global expert in AI. Now, I've been following it closely for 30 years. I do know quite a bit about it. But if I need someone who's a deep expert in AI, I've got a list of people who I'll reach out to because they really know their stuff. But you know what? You and I, hopefully, we are smart enough to ask smart questions to get where we need to go fast. But you don't have to be an expert to do that. Absolutely. Now, a couple of other things that you went into in the book that I would love to touch on. Ah. You talk about the challenges to healthcare leaders as they face this proximity. So challenges and opportunities that are different sides of the same coins. So I'm an LP in some venture funds, limited partner. And I was just on an update from one of my favorite funds, Seven Wire Ventures. They're based in Chicago. They're exclusively in digital healthcare. They founded Livongo, for instance. They didn't just invest in Livongo, they founded it. And that went public. And then a couple of years ago was the largest digital health acquisition in, in history, $19 billion. So they were talking about their current portfolio. And, and one of the partners, Lee Shapiro, was sharing some re recent research that he found about resistance, not just within health systems and with health providers, but also within the public at large. And there was some openness to relying on artificial intelligence to support diagnostics, health advisory, prescriptions, and things like this. But there was a, a lot of resistance to this notion. And some of it is very well founded because it's life or death. It's my health. I think it's quite clear over the next few years, those perspectives are going to change dramatically. I'll use a far afield example. My first love is history. And when railroads first started coming out in the early 19th century, and heaven forbid later on, the, the automobile, oh my gosh, talk about <laughs> uh, risk. When railroads were first tracking in the early 19th century, there were very serious conversations between scientists, engineers, and industry people. How fast can we go before humans start to black out and die? <laughs> and there literally was early days in the 19th century, the consensus had reached the point where they said, you know what, it's really kind of 35 miles per hour. Once we start to get past 35 <laughs> miles per hour, people are going to black out and they're probably going to die. <laughs> and you know what? We evolved. And then later on, the automobile came out and people said things, very smart things like, wait a minute, that's dangerous. What if you get in an accident? People could die. Guess what? That's right. People die every day. But guess what we do? Now we've gotten safer and better. We have seatbelts, et cetera. Uh, unlike when I was a kid and we just loved to roll around in the back of the station wagon. But still, even today with all this technology, people still die. But we've accommodated that. We've digested it. And the same thing's going to be happening 
with technology and AI and healthcare. But let's flip for a second to the opportunity side, because that's one of the most exciting spaces to me. And it's partly a, a personal story that I think I mentioned in the book. My father, Bob Walcott, who was one of the greatest influences of my life, of course, he passed away at the age of 63, totally unexpectedly. He had just had a full physical clean bill of health. And two months later, he died of an aortal aneurysm. Now, imagine we're in the not distant future from today, Mahan, and you already have your aura ring or your Apple watch, but imagine, I don't know, we're a decade from now and you've got always on comprehensive health monitoring of every weak signal in your body. And there's an AI system constantly reviewing that. And then you get a note, hey, you know what, Mahan, it looks like you might have an issue. It's not a big deal, still early, go talk to your doctor. And it turns out that you've got stage zero pancreatic cancer. And the doctor says, look, not a huge deal. We can fix this. Here you go. Compare that to even today with something like pancreatic cancer. People carry it around for a long time. They don't even know they have it. They wait until they've got horrible symptoms. They go into the doctor. They present with the symptoms. And the doctor says, you know what, Rob, I'm sorry to say you've got stage three stage four pancreatic cancer, there's really not much we can do. So what we say in the book, and in each of the industries, we ask, how is proximity going to transform each industry? And it's a little different industry to industry. In healthcare, proximity pushes healthcare from curing things to preventing things, because we'll increasingly see problems before they're a problem and have solutions. So I'm very excited about the near and medium term future of healthcare. I'm very excited as well, Rob, and just reflecting on the fact that I think even in the next couple of years, we will not be likely to want to go to a doctor who doesn't use AI, let yeah. alone that future where things will be preventative. Every single day, there are more than 3,000 medical abstracts or journals that are published. And I can guarantee you, none of our doctors are keeping up with all that is published. That's so right. we will want them to access this AI. One of the things I wonder though about is the inclusion and equity aspects of this, most especially in healthcare, because I imagine all of these will require investments and resources on the individual, and on the societal level. What are your thoughts about that as this proximity impacts healthcare? I'm actually optimistic about this uh, for a few reasons. One is the broader and more diverse, and I don't necessarily mean identity diverse, that's part of it, but I just mean generically in terms of data. The, but the broader and more diverse the data to which you have access, as well as the volume of data, the more things that we can do with artificial intelligence. And so there'll be a natural desire on the part of industry and the part of these systems, if we can say that they have desires, to digest more and more data. Second, there are a number of initiatives that are underway right now, been going increasing uh, rapidity over the past decade, rapidity over the past decade to collect genetic data, to collect health data, to, uh, if you look at the amount of capital uh, the amount of capital going in, for instance, to women's health, to try and understand the situation, gather data, support the unique needs of pediatrics or, uh, or um, uh, gynecological conditions. Example, like uh, from a from a genetic diversity perspective, Global Gene Corp. A friend of mine, Sumit Jamuar, used to founded used to run that. Run that. He since moved on to other things, but. It's, it's an entity that was an entity that was founded to collect genetic data, particularly from South Asia, although it was vision was worldwide. So how do we build uh, deeper, broader data sets of genetic information from traditionally underrepresented communities? So I think, I think there are a lot of initiatives going on. There's a lot of money going into that from a lot of directions for many different purposes. But the natural act of these systems will be to access and digest more and more diverse, data from all over the place. And I think over time, so Mahan, to your, to your question, it's an essential challenge that we have to overcome together, but I'm optimistic about it because the power will come from broader and deeper, more diverse data from 
all over the world, the more contrasting situations and examples that AI systems have to process, the better their outcomes can be, the more they can learn. So I think there'll be a natural dynamic that drives us toward gathering more and more of these data. In the long run, I'm actually rather optimistic about that. That's great to hear for a whole host of reasons. Now, you also mentioned the potential with VR and yeah. space and would love to get your thoughts on each one of those that I think will be really impactful as well. Well, thanks. I mean, as you might guess, those are two of the most fun spaces to think about this, no pun intended, I guess. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that Kaihan and I say about proximity, and it sounds hyperbolic, but it's not. And that is, this is the direction of every industry for the rest of our careers. Now, will we still have centralized production for certain things and power production and big power plants? And of course we will where it makes economic sense, but that's not new. That's what we've had for 200 years. We've been going in that direction. What is new is proximity. And part of the reason we feel confident making such a potentially hyperbolic statement, like this is the direction of every industry the rest of our careers, is the two horizons of the 21st century for humanity are space and virtual reality, because we've never really been there before. Now, of course, a few of us walked on the moon, or maybe we did, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> and I, by the way, I do believe we went to the moon. Uh, I'm more, that was a joke. I just want to be very clear to everybody, okay? This is not a conspiracy <laughs> theory show, at least I don't think, Mahan. Uh, can, Virtual reality, you know, we had like Space Invaders and Pac-Man last century, but that's pretty thin. So these are truly the new horizons for humanity. And here's the punchline. They're both 100% proximate. What do I mean by that? Before COVID, I was talking to a good friend, Dorit Denobiel. She's a professor at Baylor in space medicine. Yes, there is such a thing, space medicine, space health. And she leads NASA's grant program called Trish, which is investing in space health research. How do we have human beings in space for long periods of time and keep them healthy? And as I was describing proximity to her, she said, oh my gosh, Rob, everything we're investing in for research to allow humans to be in space is to drive proximity. I didn't know that before, but now I know that. Why is that? Because when you're on a spaceship to Mars for seven months or whatever it is, you've only got what's on the spaceship. So whatever you need had better already be there. So therefore all the food and health and entertainment and, uh, and communication and everything that we're doing to help humans being in space is to be proximate. You can't call Amazon if you forgot something, at least not yet. I mean, that'll come. <laughs> and second in virtual reality, and in a way to me, even more exciting than space because it's unlimited. It's only limited by imaginations. And I didn't say our imaginations because pretty soon it could be AI's imaginations. But as virtual reality becomes better and better, and I don't just mean when you put the goggles on and the resolution is a little better, that's nice. But I mean, 10, 20, 30 years from now, virtual reality will get better and better. And over time, we'll get to the point where we can't really tell the difference experientially between virtual reality and default reality. And default reality, by the way, Mahan, is what techie people refer to real life, right? So it's <laughs> default. It's the reality I've defaulted to by being here on Earth, okay? After the point where we can't tell the difference between virtual and default, we will be in what my colleague Moran Cerf, who's a neuroscientist, and I call the post-virtual world. Why do we call it post-virtual? Because after the point you can't tell the difference, no one will ask a stupid question like, should we meet in the real cafe or the virtual cafe? That question won't make any sense. There'll be dimensions of experience in reality. And we call that the post-virtual world, which by the way, is the, the next book. That's a book that I've just started to return to. I had to quit working on it to get proximity out there. It was bandwidth and focus issue, but now <laughs> summer, fall, I'm coming back to post virtual. So that'll be a book in a couple of years. Well, why is that proximate? That means as VR gets better and better, we'll have more and more experiences, eventually comprehensive lived experiences that are experienceable anywhere by anyone. 
and any kind of experience producible. Uh, you could produce an environment and put it in storage, or you could produce an environment real time, uh, response to your needs and desires. Or unfortunately, there's dark side. There are a lot of dark sides here. What could people or nefarious actors of various sorts do to manipulate or challenge those lived environments, for instance? But in any case, it's all completely proximate. Each and every one of these changes, these proximate changes that you talk about, Rob, will significantly revolutionize our world, how we live, and how we interact. I go back to both as an individual and as a leader. What do we need to do to be able to keep up with this? It is mind blowing. Therefore, how do we need to get ourselves and our organizations ready and more capable? You ask two very related but very different questions. One is, how do you keep up? First of all, don't imagine you're ever going to completely keep up with everything. It's just going to go too far. <laughs> but you got to give it a best shot, right? So let's do the best we can. One thing that I love is I love to find people who are so focused and passionate on a particular space that they keep track of it and share it. And so I look for people like that. I've been following, for instance, in the AI and virtual space, I've been following a fellow named Shelly Palmer. He's a media guy in New York City, very well known within his spaces. And he has a, an email blast every day. A little story. It's very efficient. I don't read the whole thing, but I always look at his email blast. I skim down it. And if I see something that piques my interest, I click through. Pleased to say, if I've really got something on my mind, I can ping him and say, hey, Shelly, what do you think about this? So he's an example. Another one that I picked up not too long ago is TLDR AI. And every day they send out a note. Now this one trends, Shelly's more toward media and public sphere and policy and things like this. TLDR has some of that, but they also have stuff for coders and people who are actually building this crazy stuff. I can wade through a little bit of that and pick some things up. So I look for people who know their stuff and that communicate it, and I rely on them. Another thing you do if you're a leader in an organization, undoubtedly, you've got some people in your organization for these new technologies who just love them anyway. And they're following them, even though maybe it has nothing to do with their job, or maybe it does. I remember a firm I co-founded years ago called Clario, and hello to all the Clarions out there. I'm still on the board. I'm not an active consultant with Clario, but I still love the team there, and I'm on the board. And we had a guy some years ago who absolutely loved 3D printing. And he would play around with it, keep track of it, try stuff. And so we said, hey, you know what? Every time you see something really interesting with 3D printing, tell us about it. Now, was that a job for him? Of course not. He's, oh my gosh, I get to tell you about something I love. So if you're a leader, find somebody in your organization who loves TikTok. Find somebody in your organization who's way into AI. Somebody who is trying 3D additive manufacturing all the time, has a little lab at home and is a basement trying stuff out and say, I want to know what you're seeing. And they're going to light up you're going to get great stuff out of them and they're going to feel really committed because you're leveraging something that's important to them. And then meanwhile, you're learning. I love that because part of what that does, Rob, is you talk a lot about dispersion as a part of decision making. That disperses more of that expertise, knowledge, resources within the organization rather than the centralized approach we've taken yeah. for so long. Yeah, let me build on that. I actually have been spending the last decade or so more and more time thinking about how do we as leaders craft better challenges for our teams and ourselves? How do we pose better questions? You and I started on that point here on the podcast. I'll give you one example. I do an exercise in my exec ed teaching I call exploratory challenges. So I'm asking the participants in these programs, and these are mid-career executives, sometimes very senior, very successful. And I tell them, okay, for this exercise, do not talk about solutions. And, and by the way, you're going to want to, 
because that's your natural act. The higher you go in your career, the more everybody's looking at you for the answer. And by the way, you're looking at yourself for the answer too. This exercise, do not talk about solutions at all. And I'll tell them that. And then I give them a one page thing that says here, define an exploratory challenge where you don't know what the answer is, right? Do not include the answer in the challenge. And then at the bottom, it says, do not discuss solutions. And so they go off to their breakout rooms. I give them 45 minutes or an hour. They go off to the breakout rooms. They come back and report back. And I say, who wants to share? And somebody starts sharing. And inevitably, they start talking about solutions to the problem, right? I said, okay, who else likes to share? And then they start talking about their challenge. And they start talking about... And I said, you know, how many of you ended up talking about solutions? And 90% of the hands go up. It's really hard to not do that. Now... If it's a situation, Mahan, where you really should know the answer, where this is your job, you've seen this for 30 years, then a directive is just fine. That's the right thing to do. But when you're facing high uncertainty, there are times when you need to recognize as a leader when you should not have the answer, when you should craft a well thought out exploratory challenge, give it to your team and ask them to explore and don't lead the witness. What do I mean by that? If you say to your team, hey, go figure out how we can radically improve customer service. Okay. By the way, I kind of think AI would be great for that. But you know what? <laughs> Search broadly. You, you can look at anything. Don't use my perspective. You know, I'm going to come back in two months and Mahan, you know what they're going to say. They're going to say, oh, boss, AI is going to be great. And you're going to say, oh my gosh, I was so smart. You don't want that. You want to trust them to go out and discover stuff. And they might even discover stuff you didn't even think of. And so what does that do? That empowers them. That says to them that you trust them to use their minds and a little bit of company resources to go out and solve something. And you're saying, I don't know what the answer is. Together, we're going to find the best possible path we can find. And so it's a staff development, a capability development and personal leadership development opportunity as well. It is a great way to develop other people. And I also believe, Rob, when we read new things that stretch our mind, we see new possibilities. Yeah. One of the lessons that I've learned over the years is that by looking at adjacent spaces and innovation in adjacent spaces, that can also stretch our minds with respect to what is possible within our space. And one of the things I love about your book, the examples and the proximity that you talk about in these different spaces is the fact that it has stretched my thinking. Most of my work is in professional services, but it has stretched my thinking on how the proximity will impact professional services. So it's right. great to be able to look at these different spaces. Well, Mahan, I would be eager at some later date. I'd love to hear your thoughts about how proximity will relate to the field of professional services. But I'll also say that looking through your podcast and the sort of questions that you've asked and the way we've interacted, you're already pretty far ahead of this game because you're reaching out to people from a variety of fields and roles and, and expertise and backgrounds. And so it's kind of like a natural act for you. It is wonderful and it is a joy for the audience, Rob, to get a chance to hear insights and examples from brilliant minds stretching their thinking. And I challenge them to not just be happy and satisfied with this conversation, stretch their thinking in reading your book, which as I said, I really enjoy it. It has stretched my thinking in reading the book and then seeing how it applies in their team, their organization, rather than seeing it as some distant future, in many instances, this future, a little bit like the side view mirrors of cars. It's closer images, than it appears. It's closer than it appears. <laughs> I think some of what you're talking about is closer than it appears. So it's important for us to be able to do that. Yeah. Now, your book just came out. So how can the audience find out more about your book right. and follow your work, Rob? You can buy it on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. You go to your local bookstore, order it. It's available in all major venues. And, and in addition to getting a copy, which I'm quite thankful for, you know, if somebody is motivated to do so, I'm on LinkedIn all the time. So 
reach out to me on LinkedIn and say, by the way, I heard your conversation with Mahan so that I have some context because, you know, I know who you are, but say, I heard your conversation with Mahan and I read the book and here's some thoughts. You know, I'm eager for that kind of feedback and input because this is not a one and done sort of uh, venture. As long as Rob, they don't reach out and say your professional background looks impressive and then some sales message. Yeah, they that. want to sell me some SEO, right? <laughs> Which is now the automated version yeah. of outreach on <laughs> LinkedIn. I really appreciate, Rob, there are some books that stretch our thinking and there are some books that blow our mind and really expand our thinking. Yours blew my mind and really expanded my thinking which is why I want to spend more time with it and really think about the implications. Just understanding proximity is not enough. It's thinking through the implications for myself, for my clients, and I encourage the audience to do the same as well. Thank you so much, Rob Walcott. Mahan, thank you. And your words and your time and your interest means so much to me. It's deeply related to my personal professional purpose. So thanks so much for all you do.